at whatever stage of engagement and activism and activating that we are in, we always have to be asking ourselves, what am I tearing down? But what am I helping build in its place? Because if you only do the first and you don't do the second, that you're not actually creating the kind of liberated societies you say you're committed to. And frankly, you're just as bad as the destructive forces that you say you're opposing. So we are talking to Brittany Packnett Cunningham. I heard. A lot of what I feel she talks about centers yeah. around this idea of not having any fear. Mm. That change makers, inherently by the fact that they're just change makers, yeah. are meant to actually be a thorn. What do you think about that? How I mean, do you I relate think, to that? I, you know, I mean, fear is like, yeah. you know, I, I just think it's part of our human experience, you mm. know? I get afraid a lot, man. Mm. Which is crazy because I work in public, like, yeah. space, you know? It makes, like, no sense. Yeah, you chose a life of fear. Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. Like, to be reminded every day of my life <laughs> that there's gonna be some fear here. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think, I think, uh, you know, it's easier. It's interesting because I think it's easier for me to overcome the fear of performing and being mm. in front of people. Mm. But sometimes when you have to take a stand mm. in a social setting mm. for a cause, mm. there's fear associated with that. What do you think about that? Like, I always felt that when you're about to do something important, you get scared. Uh, yeah. And that's the that's the thing that I've I've, I've I'm trying to tell myself mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and mean, what would happen? I actually think about what would happen mm -hmm. if all of the most powerful change makers in the world decided one day that they were just scared like ah, yeah where will we be mm -hmm. as a civilization right yeah. now yeah yeah mm -hmm. and i think some of her activism actually speaks to this idea of building things up mm -hmm. and then she also i know she talks quite a bit about um breaking things down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i almost think that when you're just part of the building up, mm -hmm. you don't even need to worry about necessarily yeah, breaking real, things up. Right? Things will break down on its own because yeah, yeah. you're building something and all yeah. the all the pieces on the side that are not meant to yeah. meant to be there will just fall off. Yeah, I love that, that that's part so much a part of her focus. So yeah, yeah it's going to be good stuff, man. Yeah. You know, I think we're almost about time. We should go you want to call her or should I call her? You ready? I think you should call okay, her. Okay, let's she, go. She would like to hear me. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> okay. Brittany, it is so exciting to have you here. I'm so glad to be here. Oh my goodness, thank you for being with us. You've been doing all these things for quite some time and you know, it would be really great to hear in your words mm. Mm. what you're doing right now and how you got there. Gosh, um, I mean, it just depends on the day <laughs> in terms of what I'm doing, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but what is true about my life right now is that I feel so blessed to have been able to curate an experience such that no matter what I'm doing, I get to focus on justice, which is not something everyone can say they get paid to do, yeah, right? Yeah, um, right. which is just such an immense privilege and blessing. So, um, sometimes I'm doing that on television. I am a, an analyst and contributor for NBC News and for MSNBC. I'm often on there talking about anything from white supremacy to voter suppression to police violence and women's issues. Um, uh, sometimes I'm doing that on my podcast, Undistracted. We just closed out our first season. It was kind of wild to start a podcast in the middle of a pandemic, but you do what you got to do. It's an amazing um, podcast I listen to. It's amazing. Amazing. Oh, thank you yeah, so much. So that means so much to me. Yeah. Um, we really wanted to unapologetically take an intersectional womanist lens to the world. Wow. So no matter what we're talking about, that's the lens that we're looking at it through. And I, you know, after years as an activist, really intentionally decided to make a pivot toward media, not for the sake of being visible, because plenty of the work that I do in media is actually fully behind the scenes. Mm. It's because I realized very quickly that we needed to be our own storytellers. Mm. So I remember being on the streets of Ferguson and I would be out on the street and then come home and turn on network news, cable news. I would listen to the radio on the way and the, the ways in which we were being intentionally and unintentionally misrepresented were deeply disturbing to me. Mm -hmm. The ways in which the freedom struggle of people who've been pushed to the margins uh, in this country and around the globe um, are intentionally left out of conversations um, really pushed me to not only say, how do I carve out a seat for myself and others like me at the table, but how do I build a new table? Mm. So if I'm learning how to make good news on NBC, how am I learning how to create the platform myself with Undistracted? Um, and so I just feel so privileged to be 
in a group of amazing women and non-binary folk who create that podcast. And we're ready for our second season uh, the coming later this fall. And then the third kind of professional hat that I wear, I'm vice president of social impact at BET. I'm somebody who grew up watching BT, right? Like I remember watching yeah. Oh, yeah. Ananda Lewis on oh, yeah. Team Summit. Oh, yeah. I remember 106 and Park. You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. This is like a legacy mm -hmm. network for us. So the opportunity to be able to help a company and a media space that I deeply believe in transition from just doing kind of corporate social responsibility, which is a fancy way of saying that folks write checks to charities. And that for so long has been the standard in corporate America to really figuring out how BET can leverage all of its levers, its programming, its music, its reach across the globe, its, re its reach into places that other networks don't reach, um, its ability to amplify and represent Black people from across the diaspora and identity spectrums. Um, to really figure out how we use every single one of those levers to make impact mm. and not just to write a check yeah. is a really beautiful experience. So I'm getting to do this media thing from all different angles, but all of it is focused on justice. And then, you know, it, on any given day, I'm writing something or planning something or organizing something in the background or helping fund something in the background um, to make sure that every industry is really thinking about how we create change. So um, I sit on the Gucci Changemakers Council, the Sephora Equity Advisors, because we all care about fashion and plenty of us are buying makeup mm -hmm. and those yeah. are places where we should be just as seen and heard. I just joined the Action Council for the Children's Defense Fund. So mm -hmm. doing a lot of advocacy work, uh, not just on behalf of young people, but beside young people and behind young people. Um, and making sure that things like, you know, the child tax credit and lots of these other climate issues and other things that um, deeply concern young people are really being um, heard about and talked about in all of the corners of Washington. Um, yeah, that's what I do. I got here because I was raised by two people who uh, made it very clear that this is the work that you choose, that, that we choose to do. This is the family business. And I'm, I'm grateful every single day that I get to wake up and focus on the people who are least focused on. Mm. <laughs> she something I know. Something I hear Masood say all the time: "Are you tired?" <laughs> I'm tired, but I'm not exhausted. <laughs> okay, good. You still got juice in you, energy in you. That's yeah. it's it's amazing. Yeah. What what would you say is that driving force for you that keeps you at it every day with your mind focused on justice? Yeah, because it's yeah. hard work. It's hard work. It is hard, and yeah. it's it's um. I would say that a couple, there are two things in particular that keep me focused and keep me in perspective, yeah. right? Because I lead by saying that doing this kind of work and getting paid for it is a privilege mm. because the least paid, the least resourced, the least supported people in the entire world mm. are the activists and the organizers and the agents of change who do the most important work. Like we're talking about the people who literally shift the ground that we stand on, the people who make sure that our water is clean, the people who make sure that our air is breathable, the people who make sure that, you know, um, incarcerated folks can get freed, right? Those are the folks that we're making tap dance for dollars and have to scrounge together a life, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I feel grateful to have been raised by people who help me understand whether you make a lot or a little, this is work for us to do. Um, and I really do count it as a privilege because there are lots of people who, because they are trying to support a family, support a community, support a household, um, support themselves, do not, are, are not afforded the time, right? Are not afforded the resources of the platform um, to do what I'm able to do sometimes. And so I, I really never want to take that privilege lightly. Mm, mm. Um, and I really want to always understand it to be a responsibility. I also just think like, Look, we get to do this in a time where we can have podcasts. I can sit in a nice air conditioned office and we can talk about the things that matter. Ida B. Wells was not given the opportunity. You know what I'm saying? She had to um, create new spaces that took seriously the American terrorism of lynching um, to the point where they bombed her office, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, she wasn't in it, um, but they tried to destroy the institution she was building. 
Um, and and there is a, a, a risk that people who came before me have taken yeah. without any of the kind of creature comforts that I have been able to partake in, right? Yeah. So I often say our ancestors did far more with far less. So mm. if Harriet Tubman could keep going and Ida B. Wells could keep going and yeah. Fannie Lou Hamer could keep going, like I, Claudette Colvin could keep going, then there's really no reason mm. why I should stop. Yeah. Um, mm. The last thing is that I, I was raised in a religious household mm. and I say religious, but I really should say um, a deeply spiritual household. Mm -hmm. My dad was a pastor of a large historically black church in St. Louis. It was a place that Dredd and Harriet Scott had history. Mm -hmm. um, my mother uh, is an educator and a social worker by trade, but also a Sunday school teacher. Mm. The first Bible I ever got only had brown and black illustrations in it. Like everybody in there was a person of color, which was historically accurate. <laughs> um, and I was like raised by two black liberation theologians who helped me understand that um, the example of Christ is not about thinking that you are better than anybody. The example of Christ is about being a thorn in the side of the status quo. Mm. Um, and that if you are not willing to do that, mm -hmm. then you are not um, actually worshiping the God you claim to be worshiping. Mm. Um, and so I think when you put all of those things together, wow. um, I kind of don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> mm. I love it. I love it. Man, I'm thinking about like, you know, like some of what you and I talked about a little bit, mm. um, Nava, about mm. this whole idea of, you know, like women kind of being at the center, a lot of the change that has taken place historically. We know that in the civil rights movement, I mean, Dr. King and uh, Ralph David Abernathy and these cats might have got the publicity, but it was really women yeah. ferrying cats back and forth between locations and doing the organizational yeah. work that really was the glue that kind of held the movement together. So, yes. and you talked about legacy. I mean, I'm hearing legacy a lot you mm. know, in this conversation. And I'm thinking about how, you know, the ancestors serve as a point, a touchstone of inspiration for us to continue in this process and doing That's the work. Right. I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm so interested in hearing a bit more, like when, you, when you're having, when things get tough and difficult, because like we said, this is hard work, it ain't easy. And yeah. you're thinking about the, the ancestors, the sheroes that came before you, and you're drawing on that inspiration, you know? How do you think, you know, for, for, for folks, for, for, for um, people who are getting involved in these spaces where they want to make a contribution, who may not be thinking in terms of ancestors, I mean, what do you say to them mm -hmm. about drawing on that inspiration from the past in order to keep them moving forward? Because I think it's such an important, you know, resource yeah. to draw on, you, you know? You know, I really, um, I really like to think about the fact that not only do I have ancestors to rely on, mm. I'm also becoming somebody's ancestor, mm. right? Mm. So I don't want to look my future children in the face. I don't want to look my nieces and nephews in the face. I don't even want to look my, you know, what, who I call my young siblings who are these younger folks who are, you know, on the front lines of protest movement and climate change movements and movements against police violence and hunger right now. I don't want to look them in the face mm. and not be able to be proud of what I'm doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't want them to ask me, what did you do when, mm. um, and not have a decent answer. Mm -hmm. There are always questions about who we would have been at any given point in history. Who would you have been, um, when the Jews were being persecuted um, mm. by the Nazis, who and what would you have done during the era of the Chinese Exclusion Act? Mm -hmm. Who uh, would you have been during women's liberation and the fight for Roe versus Wade? Who would you have been mm -hmm. during the mid-century civil rights movement? Who would you have been and where would you be during the labor movement? You don't have to ask yourself mm. where you would have been back then because you can ask yourself where you are now. right now yeah. and what you are doing right now. Yeah. Mm. What are you doing about the existential threat that is climate change? Mm. What are you doing about what is happening to Haitian migrants at the border yeah. today? What are you doing about police violence that is wreaking havoc on our communities every single day? Mm. What are you doing about the fact that in a country with this much abundance and wealth, people are still going hungry? Mm. Mm. Like there is opportunity to become a good ancestor right now. Mm. And so if you don't feel like you have the connection with or knowledge of your ancestors to pull on from the past, then like start defining 
what your ancestral legacy will be right now. Mm. So this in two years, two days, or 200 years, somebody can pick up the artifacts of what you did now and mm. have a blueprint for how they move forward. Yeah. I love that. I you know, that. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. I think everyone has such, we have such a small window yeah. of opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to play a part in all of the course of these events. Mm. Just a small window of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then if we don't take it, we miss it. Yeah. And it's our bounty and it's our blessing to take that opportunity. Yeah. And I think one of the things, at least for me, that I always say to people mm -hmm. that my biggest fear on my deathbed is that I will have said, shoot, I didn't do all the things mm -hmm. that I could have mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. because yeah. I was scared. Mm -hmm. I was scared mm -hmm. of what people thought. I was scared of disrupting or making people uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, I was scared of being the thorn on the side. And I think, especially for women, we are we are groomed hmm. in such a way hmm. in this system to yeah. um to, to to be the pleasant one. Yeah. To uh be the sweet and mm -hmm. kind one, mm -hmm. to not ruffle any feathers. Mm -hmm. What has that experience been like for you? You know what I will say is that I'm actually really grateful that um I've gotten the chance to like learn and mess up and get better and develop a deeper politic about this mm. stuff mm. Um, because there have been times when I've been afraid and there have been times when I ruffled plenty of feathers and there have also been times when I have chosen to let somebody else ruffle the feathers, right? right? Yeah. Um, um, courage is a practice, mm. right? And the, the more you exercise that muscle, the stronger it gets, um, which which can take time and we're, we're it, it, if you're not perfect at it today, it doesn't mean that you're a failure. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. It doesn't mean that you're good enough as long as you get up tomorrow and choose to practice it again. Um, Audrey Lord, who continues to be one of my guiding lights on, on feminism, on womanism, on um, what it means to like inhabit a feminine body or a feminine identity with power, um, one of my favorite things that she ever said was she said, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. Mm -hmm. And what I personally take from that is like fear exists. Yeah. Fear in a lot of ways is actually a really good signal, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to have fear in our bodies because fear can be an indicator that we shouldn't go in a certain direction. You're walking around in the zoo. You should be fearful of sticking your hand in the tiger cage because you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And fear is there to tell you don't stick your hand in the tiger cage, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not like fear is something that we should expel from our bodies and our minds. It is a natural emotion. The question is, what are you going to do anyway? What are you going to do and do afraid, right? And what are you going to do to give yourself the perspective of realizing that the innate power that we have, um, using that in service of our vision diminishes fear's importance, right? It diminishes the role that fear gets to play in how we move forward. Because if I practice courage enough and I get more and more deft at it and that muscle gets stronger and stronger, I'm really spending less and less energy thinking about what scares me. I'm spending less time thinking about how people will respond. I'm spending less time thinking about what the risk is because I'm really spending more time thinking about what the risk is if I don't speak up, mm, right? If mm, I don't exhibit courage. Mm. The risk is far greater to Haitians at the border right now yeah. than it is to me pissing somebody off mm -hmm. for what I tweet or where I donate, mm, mm, right? Mm. Um, and so perspective about fear, I really think has been instructed for me, especially over the last couple of years, as I've tried to really unlearn this, to your point, um, societal mandate that as a person who identifies as a woman and as a black woman, that I uh, choose not to be confident or to be powerful because it annoys people and it bothers them, right? Um, and so practicing courage and learning how to diminish fear has been an important exercise. I think a lot of people think it's easy for people like me and it's really not. I wish you could see what my inbox looks like. It looks wild. And it's not just from strangers. It's from people I know. When I was on the streets of Ferguson, it was from people who donated money to our cause. And I've got like people who 
Um, given that I ran an education organization at the time, I had people whose salaries and their ability to put food on the table for their families depended on whether or not I could get that donor to write that check, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think about that time often because during Ferguson, I was, like I said, I was running an, an education organization. There were lots of donors who were very upset that I was in the streets. There were lots of donors who were very upset that our teachers and alumni and students were in the streets. Um, and they were, they were like, this is not our business, right? This is not our fight. Mm. I don't know how liberation is not our fight if our fight is supposed to be educational equity, mm. right? I don't know how we expect kids to be free in the classroom if they're not free when they walk outside of it. Um, and we lost about a half a million dollars mm. Mm. of a $4 million budget mm. that we were trying to raise from people who said, I will never write you a check again. Mm. But here's the good news that because we practiced and displayed courage when it mattered most, yeah. we ended up raising more money than ever before in the 10 year history of our organization. Mm. Because while there were people who stepped away and said, I don't believe in what you're doing, there were more people who stepped up and said, I believe precisely in what you're doing, mm. right? Um, and so like, I could have been afraid. I could have looked at those emails and those stopped checks and said, it's the risk is too high, I gotta stop. Instead, we got creative and we started asking people, different people that we had never hit up before. And those people were ready to stand in solidarity with us. People that we had never even met before from mm -hmm. across the country were sending us things because they saw the kind of courage that our team was displaying. Um, and frankly, the kind of courage that our students were displaying. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, I think about that time often because when you do the right thing, the right things will come to you. I truly and firmly believe that. Yeah. Um, it may not always be in the form of money. It may be in the form of support. It may be in the form of care. It may be in the form of a safety net. Um, but, I, you know, it's never the wrong time to do what's right. And I think that um, choosing, choosing to do that, especially as a woman of color, does not come without risk. But the reward is in the change we seek. Mm. Man, I love that. Wow. I think it's so helpful to mm -hmm. know. And I don't know about you, Masood, mm -hmm. but it's so helpful for me to remind myself because it speaks to this principle, this idea of that as we're all walking this path and creating this new world, new world order, whatever we want to call it, there are two forces at play. There's this integrative force mm. that you're very much a part of where we're bringing people together. And mm. then there's this destructive force. Mm -hmm. But what people don't realize that this destructive force, it has to occur because things have to destruct mm. so that something can be created. And yeah, there are these yeah. these kind of movements that are happening. Forces, exactly, yeah, the, exactly yeah. forces that are happening in parallel with yeah, one another. Yeah. Um, and and sometimes, for me at least, it's helpful yeah. when I see that destruction and when you when you see that negativity yeah. um, to say this is part of the plan. Like this is part of how it's yeah. supposed to happen and go. Yeah, yeah. And that's the yeah. natural resistance. Mm -hmm to this greater peace that we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that point is so well made. I often say that we uh, we have two hands um, or whatever, uh, one to battle and one to build, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That in order to create the space to build something, something has to be torn down. Um, but one, in the tearing down, we cannot forget to build. Because I think that there's a sexiness associated with the destruction of something mm. right i mean it is it is the it's the energy that you see people have strangely when their sports team wins mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. i don't understand mm -hmm. but it's the energy behind smash the patriarchy yeah. mm. does the patriarchy need to be smashed absolutely yeah. mm -hmm. but what gets left if all you do is destroy yeah, right exactly. you leave people with ruin yeah if you don't create new practices new ways of being, new institutions, new structures, new curriculums, new language, new opportunities. If you don't create all of that stuff in the place of what you smashed, yeah. all people will do will move, will be to move to their lesser defaults and create a new, similarly inequitable status mm. quo, mm. right? In order to create equity and liberation in the world, we have to be deeply intentional. Yes. Mm. Mariam Kaba, who is an incredible prison abolitionist who's been working for a very long time, is a fantastic book people should read. She says all the time, abolition is creative. Mm. That people think we just want to close jails and that we just want to reconstitute public safety and that we just want to defund the police. And it's like, yeah, we want to do those things, but we want to create things in its place that truly keep people safe. 
that truly give people the mental health care that they need, that truly give people safe housing and safe communities, that truly help people restore justice, right? That truly help people understand justice as something beyond just punishment and the taking away of things. That truly um, gives us the space and opportunity to create a world where we're not, it, we don't have to just punish people for crime because we're actually preventing crime from happening in the first place because people have what they need. Yeah. So much crime that we experience is crime of lack, right? It's folks who are creating um, uh, black markets and industries because that's the only way that they can make money, right? Why? Because their education might have been piss poor. Their opportunities to enter the, their chosen field may have been limited because of their race or their gender or their economic status or their nationality or their nation of origin. Like there are reasons mm -hmm. why we end up in these situations. Mm -hmm. And what abolitionists like Maryam Kaba are saying, instead of constantly picking at the symptoms, let's actually get at the virus. Let's right. get at the root mm. of the problem and solve it from there because that's how you create truly safe communities from the ground up instead of over-policing them from the top down. Um, so your point is so critical. And I think at whatever stage of engagement and activism and activating that we are in, we always have to be asking ourselves, what am I tearing down? But what am I helping build in its place? Because if you only do the first and you don't do the second, then you're not actually creating the kind of liberated societies you say you're committed to. And frankly, you're just as bad as the destructive forces that you say you're opposing, right? Um, and it's important that we define ourselves differently from those folks, not just by what we say, but by what we do mm. and how we operate. I love that, man. It's making me, you got me thinking about like, um, in this process of doing the work, right, and being engaged in, 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 in change and creating a world that's more inclusive, more representative, I'm thinking about the, about the importance of um, advocacy and encouragement mm -hmm. for the engagement of those who might, you know, be feeling a little daunted by, you know, yeah. by the circumstances, who might not be sure that they can make a contribution. Mm. And I'm thinking about the way yeah. like we stigmatize like different groups, like, you know, particularly black and brown folk and particularly women who are twice marginalized, yeah. right? And I'm thinking about like folks who don't follow a traditional path to like make a contribution. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't go to school. Maybe they go to school and don't finish. Maybe they, they get pregnant out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. And we have diminished them and their capacity or their ability yeah. in our own minds to make a contribution because of a circumstance or a choice that they've made and they found themselves in. So they just become the subtotal of the decision that they've made mm. and we don't see a larger yeah. context for their engagement. I wonder if you could like talk to that because I think that's something that's very important for us to like address in our society. I would love to talk to that because I always think about the fact that anybody who changed the world never fit in, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. true, I mean, you can look at any industry, right? Like. Steve Jobs did not fit in. I mean, he wore the same outfit every day. <laughs> so he didn't actually have to think about extraneous things so he could give us the iPod, right? And I, I mean, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being funny here, but if you really think about anybody who revolutionized anything, right? Lil Nas X, revolutionary, right? And he does not fit into anybody's box. And in fact, him defining himself for himself makes so many people deeply uncomfortable. And it has nothing to do with Lil Nas X. It has everything to do with their own insecurities, yeah. right? Yeah. And so when we divorce our own feelings of self-worth from what folks have to say about us, because we realize that often people's unconstructive criticism of us, destructive criticism of us is about them and not about us. When we can, when we can really get that through our minds and through our spirits, then we can decide to be the unique beings that were created for a purpose bigger than ourselves. Yeah. Um, there is work for each of you to do that I am not capable of. Mm. There's work for me to do that you are not capable of because we are completely different. So I don't need to try to be like you all. And mm -hmm. you don't need to try to be like me. I yeah. actually need you to go play your role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If all of us got on stage for a play, and all of us decided that we were going to be King Lear, right. the story would yeah. never get told, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Somebody, like, there are multiple roles for people to play, and, and there are multiple ways in which all of us are prepared to play these roles. One of my favorite figures in history who exemplifies this to a T is Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer was counted out 
by basically everybody because Fannie Lou Hamer was a person who was most was one of the people who was most affected by the issues that she advocated about. Yes. Yeah. So she was advocating for poor and low income people, not just because she was compassionate, but because she was one of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. She was advocating for black farmers, not just because she was compassionate, but because she was one of them. She is not a woman who had a great deal of education, but could command an entire room. She, um, it, along with the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party, helped organize in such a way that they commanded the entire attention of the of the Democratic National uh, Convention, yes, right? Yes. And made their way to a stage and demanded that they be given seats as delicate delegates as a legitimate political party, which they were, representing the interests of people who had been forgotten about by the party apparatus. So plenty of educated, white-collar, well-heeled, wealthy, liberal people felt like Fannie Lou Hamer was a country black woman who had no idea what she was talking about. Absolutely. Plenty of black men mm -hmm. thought that Fannie Lou Hamer was a woman who talked too much and needed to stay in her place. Plenty of bourgeoisie black people felt plenty of bourgeoisie people, period, but including bourgeoisie Black people, wealthy Black people, Black people that had gone to the Howards and the Harvards, they were like, who is this woman coming up out the Mississippi dirt trying to tell me about myself when I've been the leader of the racial movement all this time? Mm -hmm. And so I truly believed that when she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, she mm. wasn't just talking about the DNC. Mm -hmm. She wasn't just talking about politics. She wasn't just talking about America. America. She was talking about all of the people, in my estimation, who had counted her out and who had marginalized her for a set of circumstances um, that in no way diminished her ability to be great and in fact increased her ability to be effective and powerful mm. because she could speak to an experience um, and a desperation and a power that none of those other people I described knew about. Mm. None of them had experienced that. That was not their life. Yeah. That was not their knowledge base. Yeah. That was not what they had come from. Mm -hmm. And so she said, what I come with doesn't make me less than. What I come with makes me more than enough. Yes. Mm. What I come with makes me more than capable to speak to this. So I don't care what your, actually, I shouldn't say that. I do care what your circumstances are because you should be looking to those to help inform how you do the work. So if you had a child as a teenager, look to that to how you inform uh, the autonomy that pregnant people have over their bodies and how you can uniquely speak to that, right? If you are somebody who grew up in poverty, look to people like Reverend William Barber and the Poor People's Movement to help you understand how you can translate your lived experience into real power because that's what it is. This idea that we all have to follow some kind of traditional pathway is what frankly will be successful in making all of us robots. Um, I, I am fundamentally clear that we are all better off because of the people who did not follow a traditional pathway and who did not see their power as being diminished by that, but who were actually empowered by that. It's well said. You're about to make me, I'm, I'm about to start testifying up in here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm a pastor's kid. Like, oh my gosh, I can feel it, I feel it. What, you feel it? You feel yeah, it? yeah, I feel it. Uh, but I'm thinking because you, you got me thinking about a lot of things, but the thing that, that you know, she's really dropping some knowledge about like, the way that if we look at like this, let's let's take a religious overview of religious traditions, right? Whether you're talking about um, ba the Baha'i faith, uh, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever you want to talk about. When God is about his business, his or her business, it seems to yeah. be that they tap folks who aren't traditionally at the front of the line. That's right. Mm -hmm. Cats who, that, that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You said a word. You know what I'm saying? You said a full word. I mean, yeah. cat, cats who aren't the wealthiest, they ain't the cutest. Yeah. They ain't the most educated. That's right. You know, they're cats and that we would dismiss. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Like yeah. I, one of, Noah was an alcoholic. Yes. Right? Yes. And according to biblical lore, yep. saved all of the species on the planet. Right. Right? Exactly. <laughs> to be very clear, mm -hmm. when Noah was out there talking about the flood is coming, people were like, boy, you crazy. What are you talking about? Yes. That don't even make no sense. Mm -hmm. You you must be drunk again. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, there is power in what you're saying, whether you are a person of faith or not, 
whether your examples are spiritually based or worldly based, there are so many examples of people throughout history who everybody thought was absolutely ridiculous. And meanwhile, they were telling us the truth. Exactly. Um, yeah, you said a whole word. You said a whole word. It's, it's deep to me because I'm thinking about like, um, I mean, there's so many examples, like you said, but I'm thinking about the whole tradition of like black music, which comes out of the field holler songs when cats were like, picking cotton, cutting sugar cane, pulling on tobacco Listen. leaf, and they're singing these songs that are encoded with these hidden meanings mm -hmm. about liberation yeah. and freedom. Yeah. The master of the house doesn't know what they're talking about. He just is like, ooh, that yeah. sounds good. Can you sing another one? Yeah. And they're like, okay, we got one for you. And out, yeah. of that, out of that, these people who were the most marginalized, the most dehumanized, the most objectified in our culture, create this incredible tradition of music that has transformed you know, um, the cultural landscape of our country. Yeah, because it's not just black music, it's American music. Thank yes. you. It's country, yes. it's bluegrass, Thank it's jazz, you. it's pop, it's hip hop. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So it's so powerful, wow. You what know, are you thinking? You got something on your mind, tell me. What you got, what you got? Every time mm -hmm. when we talk to people, even in our own work as activists, mm. I always try and take a look at what is at the root of of all of these issues mm -hmm. because when we talk to activists they're not just activists necessarily in one area they're yeah. <laughs> they're working on so many different yeah. fronts and mm -hmm. like exhibit a right mm -hmm. here with Brittany. Mm -hmm. all of these injustices are tied together yeah mm -hmm. because of this lack of understanding that we are all one mm -hmm. that your mm -hmm. destiny is tied to mine yeah that's we right. might look different, mm -hmm. come from different places, have, you know, identify with a different gender, but yeah. at the end of the day, yeah. we all have these souls that are interconnected. Yeah. That if there yeah. is oppression on one side of the globe, it impacts me. It impacts me. You, you think it doesn't. Yeah. And I think that's what yeah. the problem is. It's this apathetic just energy yeah. that exists that yeah. we've decided to adopt for convenience. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. But when there is oppression on one side of the globe, it will ultimately affect you. Wow. It's, she, she's got me when she's, she just dropped some knowledge because it's got me thinking about that quote from John Donne, the poet. We're all caught in an yeah. inescapable network of mutuality tied together forever in a single garment mm -hmm. of destiny. Mm. And then Muhammad Ali in 1975 distills that whole thing at Harvard University when they say, yo, champ, give us a poem. He thinks for a minute. He says, me, we. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's He's it. Like, Boom, there it is, That's right? It. That's it. What's beautiful about it um, is that A, it gives us all an opportunity to be great, as the king said, because we all have an opportunity to be to serve, rather. But it also helps us recognize that our diversity isn't a weakness, right? And I don't mean that in the like corporate, like, you know, you see the company put up the Instagram post that like, you know, diversity is the best of us. And then like, they go and do something anti-Black the next day. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, in such a way that if we are wise enough to create solutions, community solutions, family solutions, policy solutions that work for the most affected by a problem, then we will come up with solutions that actually work for everybody. Yes, yes. I think often about disability in this way, right? When you talk about the fact that all of our faiths are tied uh, together, mm -hmm. there were a lot of disabled organizers and activists and advocates and, and, and voices and media mavens and writers who for a long time had been talking about the kind of accommodations that should be made for people every single day, the kind of flexibility that people should be able to have, that I can do this job from home, so I should be able to do it from home. I should be able to have visual aids, and that visual aid should have closed captioning. I should, all of these things, right? All of this flexibility and these accommodations that people thought were disabled folks asking for some kind of special privilege, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And then along comes COVID, and suddenly, all of us, whether we are temporarily able-bodied or not, needed those accommodations. Oh, no, that's right. yeah. Suddenly, all of us were saying, can I do this from home? <laughs> Suddenly, all of us were saying, y'all can't get on Zoom for this. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, all of us were saying, you need to give people broadband access so that they can actually tune into the things that you want them to tune into and get the information and access that they, you say that they're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. But well, wait a minute, disabled people were talking about this the whole time. Yes. And you were saying it was a special privilege. But if 
we had possibly been following the rules of the ADA this whole time, if we had actually been accommodating the needs of disabled students and disabled workers and disabled people, if we had actually been creating those accommodations in such a way that we understood how they could function efficiently, we would have been ready. Yeah. yeah. A mm. lot more ready mm. yep. for the kind of interruption that many of us were not prepared for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of disabled people were like, I've been telling you that the whole time. Mm -hmm. Because what they were saying to us all along was that your fate is bound up with mine. Whether you are in a wheelchair or not, whether you have cerebral palsy or not, whether you have mental health issues or not, your fate is bound up with mine. And it shouldn't take a pandemic to make you realize it. Yes, yeah. yes. This like gets really at the heart for me of like the whole issue we're having right now with the, the prevalence of institutional racism, um, the sickness of institutional racism, I should say, um, and the prevalence of white supremacy um, as it is, continues to exert this like crazy influence on every facet of our society. And I really think, you know, I'm thinking about Baldwin and like, I think it was like 68 or 70 yeah. or something. Baldwin sitting on this talk show and, and, and um, I think he's being interviewed by Dick Cavett or somebody else. And um, Baldwin says, you know, it's not a matter of saving the natives. It's a matter of saving oneself. Mm. And I mm. think when we really, really reflect on that and think about it and yeah. internalize that, we realize that I might think I'm getting over my brother, my sister by doing what I'm doing. But in the end, I'm the one that's getting got. Because it's you can come back on you. That's it. Because you cannot unplug one from the many or the many yes. from the one. We are bound together. And I think that's right. About building these coalitions across cultural lines, across gendered lines. And I'm thinking specifically about being a man, right? About yeah. being a man. Yeah. And thinking about, you know, growing up with raised primarily by my mother, a sing, you know, single black woman in New York City, and seeing her struggle. And then wanting to, having proximity to her struggle, wanting to be, find out how I could best be an advocate for women in spaces. Yeah. How I could create space for my sisters to have a voice, you know? And I'm just thinking, I'm like, for the two of y'all, I'm thinking about ways that, I'm wondering if you all had like words that you all could share with men in terms of ways that we can show up and be present and be advocates, um, you know, to create spaces for women. You know, that actually speaks into directly the question I wanted to ask you, Brittany. Mm. But if I could speak to that, yeah, directly, yeah. please do. We have some incredibly well intentioned men mm. who are really trying to do the work mm -hmm. in understanding what harm the system has caused women. Mm -hmm. What's so important is that in that work, they understand how that same system is actually disadvantaging them. Mm, mm, when mm. a woman is being disadvantaged, mm -hmm. they are deprived. Mm, right. When a woman cannot access progress, when she actually can't contribute to all the arenas in the world, mm. then, it's, then it is to the deprivation of the man mm -hmm. and the progress of the entire society. Mm, mm, mm. And I think sometimes we see people welcoming women so we want to welcome women into these spaces we want to be equal you know mm -hmm. we want to we want to be fair we yeah. want to be just mm -hmm. no mm. for your benefit women need to be in your spaces mm, 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 yeah mm. your organization will not prosper without women mm, your mm. um your thought processes your consultations with your group or table mm -hmm. or group whatever mm -hmm. will not progress mm. and it's going from that place of let's be fair let's be nice mm -hmm. to actually i'm not gonna win in life without you Mm, mm. You, when right. you are removing half of the population, you're removing half of the resources that you could be using, yeah, yeah. that is to your loss. Mm, mm, mm. And I think... Yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. I mean, period, right? Yeah. You are not just advocating for others. You are advocating for yourself. Uh, yeah. I remember... Um, like last year, maybe, maybe it was the year before. I don't remember. But my husband had 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 some black women on Twitter, kind of pushing back on him on something, and mm -hmm. he kind of came to me like, "Oh, I'm so frustrated." And mm -hmm. I was like, "I hear you. Mm -hmm. I love you. Mm -hmm. I also agree with them." <laughs> <laughs> oh my 
like good Dog, night. Brittany. <laughs> I'm like good night. He was like, huh? Yeah. And I was like, I'm telling you this in love, mm -hmm. right? Because, and to be very clear, I married a man who was raised by a single mother and was asking himself all of the same questions that you were, yeah, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. Someone who I watched when we were just friends, because yeah. we met during the Ferguson Uprising, which is, yeah. I know, a very like on brand story. Mm -hmm. um, but I watched him unlearn a lot of the patriarchal yeah. habits that he had been building over time and didn't yeah. even realize it, right? Mm. So this is somebody I had watched be in intentional pursuit yeah. of being a real co-conspirator mm -hmm. to women, femmes, and non-binary people. Like mm -hmm. this is somebody who I watched wrestle and sort through his own stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and, mm -hmm. not but, but and, mm -hmm. you are still a man, mm -hmm. which means that you're not actually experiencing this identity. And as a cisgender heterosexual man, here's what you missed, mm. right? Mm. Mm. And I said, I wanna be very clear, just because I'm saying this to you as your wife, doesn't make me any better than the people, the women who were saying this to you all along, yes. right? Yeah. I'm not saying it to you any softer, any gentler, mm. any more gently. Mm. And you have to ask yourself why it took me translating it for you instead of you being able to hear it from them. That's deep, that's right? deep, that's deep. So he sat with that and he's like, okay, so yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. And what do I do? Mm -hmm. I don't know, first you need to make amends. Mm -hmm. You need to understand that everybody's not going to accept your apology, but that doesn't make you any less responsible for giving it. Um, but second of, second of all, though, in the same way with you, which you have intentionally unlearned all these other things, you now, again, to this idea of battling and building, you tore down some habits and some beliefs in your life. But in its place, you didn't build something new. Mm. So you have to go and create a new practice for yourself. You mm. have to go and find the new language. The good news is plenty of people have been writing and singing and marching and directing about all of this stuff. Yeah. So he went to our bookshelf, picked up Bell Hooks' Feminism is for Everybody. And not only did he read it himself, he actually got online and said, you know what? This is unlearning that I have to do. And I'm not telling you all this for credit. I'm telling you this for accountability. Yeah. Mm. And if there's anybody who wants to join me and help hold me accountable, feel free. Mm. So it was actually a bunch of other men, mm. men of color. Yeah. Who, they ended up having a whole book club. Mm. Wow. About feminism, fe feminism is for everybody. Mm. And that's not for me to give him a gold star. Mm -hmm. That is just me giving an example yes. that... Um, none of us are, as I like to say, born woke, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Something wakes us up and we have to keep making the choice yeah. to be, keep becoming more and more alert every single day. Yeah. So the expectation is not that any of us are perfect mm -hmm. because it will be impossible. There is not a way for, for me personally to know the lived experience of a black or brown trans woman in America. Yeah. But I do have the ability to be corrected. Mm -hmm. I do have the ability to listen and to learn. Mm -hmm. And I do have the ability to change my behavior, right? And to set and build for myself new practices. And all of us are more than capable of doing that. Yes. Um, and if you are intentional, not just about doing it, but building community as you do, then you've got some built-in folks that can help you say, hey, that was good. Or that ain't what we talked about. Because mm -hmm. you need those folks too. Yeah, I love that. I, you know the the thing that I'm that I'm like really intri I'm intrigued by a number of things that you've shared and the conversation which has been really rich you know um, and I'm just wondering from from your perspective like when you're thinking about all the things that mm -hmm. you're engaged in and you're engaged across the board with a number of challenges that are that are afflicting all of us what's the, what's the vision I mean when you come to the end of your journey and mm -hmm. you look back. What does the change look like mm. that you envision? What is that? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, I believe in um, shooting for the stars and landing on the moon. I love it. I love so it. if I'm if I'm shooting for the stars, the vision is ultimate liberation, mm. right? And what I mean by that is a world in which everyone's dignity is fully honored, mm. Mm. everyone's humanity is fully recognized. Mm -hmm. Everyone has what they need, not just to survive, mm -hmm. but to thrive. Mm -hmm. 
and everyone gets to be and be their own genius without mm. being seen as a threat. Mm. Um, mm. So that's the stars. I love that. I love um, that. For me, the moon, right? Like at the end of at the end of my time. Yeah. Is that people, in and of themselves, will be in the constant practice of harnessing their own power and um, leveraging their own tools to make that happen. Yeah. I wanna live in a world where everybody is in pursuit of that, where everybody is working on that in their own corner, in their own way, with their own gifts for their own purpose. Yeah. The moon for me is that we have built the biggest choir for justice and that we sing this song unrelentingly mm. all the time and mm. always together. I love that. I feel so committed to trying to make sure that when people experience me, mm -hmm. however it is, mm -hmm. that they walk away with more truth and with better equipment. Mm. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean my equipment, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. means more able to use their own equipment. Um, I just want all of us to know that we are fully equipped to build the kind of world that we deserve. Mm. Um, and we will get to that world much faster if we all use the equipment we got to make it happen. Wow, uh, this has been so rich. Just, I appreciate you so much. Just your insights. I appreciate your oh, advocacy I appreciate and you your all. work. Thank you for this it's platform that you all have created. Beautiful. And um, I love your focus on justice. You know, Dr. King said, uh, until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. He's qu quoting uh, Amos, of course, from the Old Testament. That's right. But um, yeah. we want to know if there's like uh, an organization, as we're thinking about practical steps for people who want to get active and engage, is there... Um, organization yeah. or even steps, like steps just someone you, watching, yeah, they can exactly. go, you know what, I can do this yeah. or I can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To take yeah. us from the, from the idea into the actual practice of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, one important step is to always, as was already said, be in an intentional pursuit of knowledge. I already talked about feminiz feminism is for everybody yeah. by bell hooks. Where do we go from here? Community or chaos mm -hmm. uh, by Dr. King is an excellent book yeah. Yeah. to really kind of wrap your arms around the context that we're working in and how we have to do this work. Um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Freire. Yeah, it's an book. incredible book yeah. to really help give global perspective on the fact that anything we're struggling with in America mm -hmm. is not just us and to ourselves and that our fates are bound up with our siblings all across the globe. Um, so being constant pursuit of knowledge is step one. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that step two um, is to find and build community. Mm -hmm. So there mm -hmm. are certainly national organizations mm -hmm. that deserve your support and mm -hmm. respect. Um, the Movement for Black Lives, the Poor People's Campaign, mm -hmm. Black Voters Matter. Um, but there are also local organizations mm -hmm. that um, we should all be doing our Googles mm -hmm. and figuring out who those people are that live right in our zip code, right in our congressional district, right in our neighborhood, who are doing the work that we care about, whether it's climate justice, whether it is uh, uh, immigration, whether it is racial justice, whatever your thing is, mm -hmm. connect yourself to and get in community with the people who are yeah. making things happen right where you are. Mm -hmm. Because so much of this is local, deeply place-based work. Um, and it can be really sexy to say, I went and did this for the ACLU, but it's even sexier to say, I showed up at my school board meeting, my city council meeting, uh, my mayoral uh, debate with this group of people who are ready to make a very distinct and specific change in my community. Um, so the first step is to get and always be getting educated. And the second step um, is to build community with people who are active. Um, and then the last thing I would say is to keep it's to always keep your sense of vision as broad and as big as possible. Mm. We will reach whatever expectations we set for ourselves. Mm. So we always have to be careful never to set our standards or our goals simply with one election or one candidate or one law or one bill or one one particular system coming down. We have to keep our vision all the way in the stars um, and do everything we can to land there. Yeah. 
Man, it's been amazing. Thank you. This has been incredible. Brittany, I, we could you are talk forever. I could talk with her like yeah. for the rest of the day. <laughs> Let me we'll have to do it again. Well, you don't. I'm totally gonna have to. You are no threat to us. You are light. <laughs> Your genius is light. That's very kind. The feeling is mutual. Thank you for sharing this space with us. Thank you for listening to us too. And yeah. thank you just for being on this journey with us. Sending you love, sister. Um, again, praying for you. And, and I know we're going to continue to hear amazing things yeah. about the advocacy that you're involved in. So thank you. I appreciate that. You thank you. Take Bless care, sister. Peace. <laughs>